Well, good morning, good afternoon, um, wherever you are. I can see a lot of people have joined the session and there's some more people still joining, um, but I think we'll get started. Um, so my name's Adam Martin and welcome to this webinar. I think JF, if we move to the first slide, that would be great. So um, today we're going to be looking at thermal structural analysis of a, a lunar rover uh, using SimCenter 3D. We're going to cover some really interesting topics, show you some demos. Um, today's presenters, I'll briefly introduce the team. Um, so yeah, Ryan, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. So on the line today, uh, I'm presenting, we have uh, um, uh, Ryan Majkut, who will go into some detail um, on the structural analysis and show you some demos of the capabilities in SimCenter. Before Ryan shows us that, uh, Jens de Boer has joined us from the Siemens team, um, and he's going to provide us and give us a nice overview of what SimCenter can offer in this space and some interesting stories of where it's been applied. Um, the last guy on the slide is myself, Adam Martin. I'm here, kind of your, uh, your host for the day. Um, we will have a chance for questions at the end of the session. That There is a uh, area in the GoToWebinar where you can ask questions. Feel free to use that throughout the session. We might pick up some of them during the session and we'll definitely answer some at the end. Uh, we will also poll yourselves for some questions and get some feedback, particularly in the second part of the presentation. So um, just a brief intro to Maya, to Jay. So here you can see a little bit about uh, Maya. So we're an organization that helps people with their digital transformation journey. Um, we are Siemens uh, partner, um, recognized as a top partner in 2021. Um, we do consulting, we do integrate system integration, we provide uh, a lot of simulation tools to our customers, but interestingly, we also develop software and we do a lot of modules which are actually part of the Sim Center portfolio um, and, and uh, provided uh, by Siemens uh, to, to you know, many, many users in, in the simulation world. Many minds are engineers, scientists, um, lots of hands-on experience in, in a number of industries, in particular the space industry, which we're looking at today. Um, and we're always looking to help people design better, simulate man um, man manufacturing and, op and optimize their operations. Um, we have some interesting combined expertise in both simulation and AI. Um, and that kind of really helps us uh, work with customers to take some of their ideas really right through to completion and project end. Um, another point of interest, what you'll see later in the presentation is some uh, the random vibration and thermal solver capability. Both of those are actually authored and written uh, by the Maya team and then embedded in the SimCenter portfolio. So just a little introduction to Maya there. Um, so now I'm going to hand the ball over to uh, Jens, who's going to take us through uh, Sim Center for Space Systems. So. Absolutely. So it is my pleasure to do the introduction for Ryan, and I'll explain a bit more, um, not in depth because we don't have the time for that, but I'll give a short overview of the um, the breadth of the Sim Center portfolio and what it can mean for the people involved in space engineering. Um, as already mentioned today by Adam, the, the team that we're following is exploration. And this is no coincidence. Um, exploration is in again, uh, whether it's on Mars, where we have quite a few rovers driving around now, or uh, uh, whether it's on the moon where I want to go back to. Uh, there are a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, challenges uh, that we want, that people want to pick up. Also more in terms of observation satellites around the Earth. Uh, so our kind of exploration, but all these topics come, all these applications come with challenges, which is what we will talk about today, because these are no easy, um, easy systems. Far from it, by the way. Um, 
these these the systems need to be well connected. They need to transmit data back to the earth. They need to be efficient, and the energy they consume, you can only take so much energy uh, uh, from uh, from the sun. Um, the rovers, for instance, if we talk about rovers, they need to be automated, uh, preferably, so they can drive autonomous or semi-autonomous on the uh, on the uh, the moon or the Mars surface, and they also need to be flexible in their usage. Um, so these are complex systems, uh, complex systems uh, that that need to be engineered in the correct way. And we, we see the example here of the Perseverance, which is a very, a very complex system with many, uh, many sensors, uh, scientific payloads, cameras. So and all that needs to be fitted on a relatively confined space and need to be protected against a number of very harsh environments. Uh, but we'll come to that. Um, now, some of the more classic challenges also remain very valid. I mean, space is typically a one a one shot experience. You build something, you shoot it into space, and then you hope that it works, or you try to make it such you reduce risks such that it doesn't work, um, such that it works. So when you do that, it also comes at the costs. So you're constantly balancing balancing costs and risks. Uh, so that is a challenge, and program manager companies are. Uh, continuously searching for ways to reduce the costs and reduce the risks of the um, the systems they're putting into space. Uh, so a space program is a complicated endeavor with multiple phases. Um, now, and it re requires the collaboration of uh, a great number of people, engineers with different specializations, even different companies. So what if you could work collaboratively with your supply chain, no matter what the tool set, if you had that openness, if you could orchestrate the technical content and the scope of your program throughout the entire life cycle in an agile way, if you could bring the engineering domains together um, and eliminate integration issues before reaching detailed design, if you have sufficient traceability uh, to trace design to trace design decisions from concept design to the final product, and also tra uh, trace final verification through the design back to the requirements, if you have that complete, if you would have that complete digital thread, and if you could continuously monitor uh, the key technical performance indicators in a uh, very um, very open way. Now, with, with Siemens, we provide you with that ecosystem. Uh, from Siemens, we give you the capabilities to model the digital twin of both the product, the production planning, the production itself, and the product as it is operating. Not only do we provide the digital twins to do that, we also give you the communication bridges, the flow of information between these different digital twins. That's Siemens at large. That's um, a big, big cookie to chew on. Uh, we're gonna narrow the focus down today a little bit. So if you if you look at today, we will be concerned about the Sim Center portfolio and what we can do in the Sim Center portfolio for performance engineering, which fits in the product design digital twin. Within the Sim Center portfolio, uh, we want to do a number of things. First of all, we want to give you the possibility to model the complexity of your systems with the required physics and the required level of fidelity. Uh, so those are the, the tools you want to give the engineering community. We also want to make it possible, make it easier to do um, exploration around those designs to explore the possibilities to do multi-domain optimization across various domains to do trade-offs and to understand uh, how an uncertainty in a certain domain affects uncertainty in another domain to do some uncertainty propagation that's another aspect of what we want to do oh, apologies okay the third thing we want to do is go faster uh, we want to automate the engineering workflow. Uh, we want to make our solvers faster. And we also want to provide you with computing capability by, by providing, by providing um, computing capability on the cloud. 
Our last topic we want to do is allow you to stay integrated. We want to give you links, links with design, uh, links with test, uh, links with require, requirements management so that you at any given moment in time know which test data was used to support which simulation data and to which requirements that links. links. That's the, the kind of digital thread we want to provide you with. Um, the Sim Center portfolio is a wide portfolio. The Sim Center portfolio is a wide portfolio. Um, it encompasses uh, multiple domains, the mechanical solution, mechanical solutions, fluids and thermal solutions, like electro electronic solutions. Those are more geometric oriented. We also have system simulations. That's typically more, uh, then you go to uh, uh, more simplified representations where you don't take into account the geometry, but you kind of um, organize that more on a, um, in, a, in an analytical way. And then we also have uh, physical testing that allows you to verify what you have done in, in simulation. We, that, those are a lot of applications, applications and we typically want to um, organize that along uh, axes that are relevant for the space industry. Spacecraft propulsion performance, structural thermal and robots engineering, spacecraft electromagnetics performance, spacecraft testing verification and qualification, and spacecraft safety and mission assurance. And what we will do for the next 10 minutes is go through these applications and give a small example for each of those applica applications of how the Sim Center portfolio can solve challenges there. Starting with spacecraft propulsion performance, which is all about getting uh, your payload into the air. So here we've um, wanted to share a use case with you, with you that we did based on uh, a NASA test case. Uh, so on the Apollo project, uh, NASA the failure of their um, nozzle um, nozzle control system. And it turned out that it was due to a recirculation of the hot gas, which heated the base plate of the rocket launcher. Uh, so this is something that currently other programs also have to verify, like SpaceX and others. Uh, so they need to ensure safe operation of a, a multi-nozzle launch vehicle by, by reducing the likelihood of base heating. And that's an area where computational fluid dynamics can help by predicting the rocket plume fluid dynamics and the heat loading, as you see here in the animation on the right. And also, um, we can also predict the plume recirculation heat loading um, in a minimal amount of time for different attitudes and, uh, and different attitudes. So you see that the plume varies as the launcher goes uh, higher into the atmosphere. And here um, on the right hand side, you see a small, you see the red dot moving. That's the change in temperature of the, uh, that's a changing um, place of the heat spots between the uh, rocket nozzles. So that's the kind of information you can uh, retrieve from our uh, computational fluid dynamics package. Next, we wanted to talk about structural thermal and robots engineering. Um, and the example we wanted to share with you there, uh, talks is an example from Talas Elenia Space. Uh, so Tala Zelenia Space um, had the challenge that they had put sensors on their satellites or some uh, high performance amplifiers that required ac active cooling to be really performant. Uh, this is in lieu of the usual uh, passive thermal management systems that in the past have been developed on satellites. So this was something new they needed to do and they turned to system simulation uh, to model the integrated satellite system, understand its dynamics during the mission, and then see how the different active cooling system, uh, including how the active cooling system, including cryogenics, uh, cryocoolers and radiators, interacted with the payload and kept the payload cool. So this is an example where we used, um, call it not geometric, but re reduced modeling, a reduced or reduced order modeling uh, to kind of with parameterization, um, create conceptual models of these kind of systems dynamics. A third axis we wanted to uh, 
we wanted to share with you today is spacecraft electromagnetic performance. Uh, the example we took here is again from Thales Alenia, uh, where they wanted to control the risk for uh, radio frequency compatibility, radiated emission, radiated susceptibility, and electrostatic discharge. Uh, the way they did that is by using our 3D high fidelity electromagnetic ana analysis to understand and address uh, radio frequency compatibility at satellite level and to mitigate the EMC uh, the EMI risk and assess ESD. So there's the, what you see here on the right in this example of how we can start from the, the, the geometry, the CAD bomb, convert that uh, into a, a, a model that we can do simulation on and then look at relevant results that can, uh, that can give the engineer insight in the, the, the RF compatibility and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the EMC risk. Fourth topic was spacecraft testing verification and qualification. So this talks more to the, uh, the testing capabilities that we have within the SimCenter portfolio. Uh, the example we wanted to share here is, is again from Tala Zelenia. Uh, where they um, turn to us to um, with a with a, with the following challenge uh, uh, that the fact they so they they shared that acoustic qualification testing is is risky and and expensive it it requires it requires specific uh, specialized rooms uh, which are expensive and which you also we have you have to go to dedicated institutes to do that and they charge a lot of money. Um, not only that, but also not for Thales, but for other, for other um, companies. So these satellite components also have to be uh, acoustically qualified uh, for use, or some of them have to be acoustic, acoustic, acoustically qualified to you for uses on satellites. And they need to ship those uh, also to these dedicated labs. And that, create, that causes a lot of, um, can cause a lot of program delays. So we work together with Thales to develop a new and alternative qualification method, uh, which is called direct field acoustic testing, which no longer requires dedicated rooms, but which allows you to construct in any given room based on loudspeakers, the uh, required diffuse field that is needed for these acoustic qualification tests. So this is a cheaper and more agile qualification method uh, that reproduces the diffuse field conditions under the uh, in, in, inside the um, the uh, um, payload housing that companies can much easier deploy in house. So, last uh, lastly but not least, I wanted to talk about spacecraft safety and mission assurance. Uh, for that application. We selected a, uh, a case from uh, NASA Godard Space Flight Center, uh, where they uh, were quite keen on keeping efficiency and consistency in, in the integration of the different systems of the Europa Clipper. And on top of that, we also wanted to move from a more from a document-centric base, so document-centric way of um, assessing reliability to a more model-based way of doing that. The way we answered uh, to that challenge and the way we helped NASA answer that challenge is by providing a model-based uh, realms analysis tool with a well-defined taxonomy uh, that includes several failure and analysis reports generated from a single model. So that's what you see here on the right. Uh, they verified that. And so the reliability predictions that they got uh, with our model-based realms tools Lined up, lined up very well with their traditional ways of doing it. Uh, on top of that, this was a lot easier and uh, much more, much more uh, straightforward to use. So, uh, good gains there. So that kind of gives you an overview of the SimCenter portfolio, the different um, disciplines we cover in the SimCenter portfolio, and how they translate into the different applications that uh, the different applications that we want to tackle um, for the the in the in the space community so to wrap it up within simcenter uh, we give you the possibility to model the complexity 
we allow you to explore the possibilities. We give you the means to go faster and we ensure that you stay integrated. And with that, I pass on the ball to Ryan, who will spend a little bit more time on the details of a thermal mechanical analysis on the um, on the Mars rover. Hey everyone. Um, so before I get into the demo, uh, I just want to give an overview for lunar rover analysis. So um, multiple modes of operation should be considered during the design of a rover. Uh, it might include launch or landing survival, worst case cold and hot operation, or nominal operation. And with dynamic response to the rover during launch and landing survival, uh, we will evaluate using random base excitation analysis. So I have um, three demos that I'm going to go over today. Uh, the first one is going to be launch survival with random vibration analysis. The second will be a thermal model for parameterized rover roving and heater sizing. And the third is a static structural model where we're going to use the uh, thermals from the second demo um, as input to our static structural model. Okay, so um, yeah, we're just going to go into our first round of polling questions here. Okay, Ryan, I'll launch the uh, first poll. So okay. just to get some feedback from from folks, um, as the, the main focus of the webinar is on uh, structural and, and thermal analysis, um, we were just interested to see kind of of, of our uh, audience who's interested in what just to get get an idea um, so we've got dynamic structural static structural thermal analysis um, you do all of it or uh, none of the but none of the above at the moment so we were just interested so about 50 percent of people have voted so I'll, I'll give you a, a few more uh, seconds to vote um, and we're actually going to cover um, this this during during Ryan's demo a lot of these. So, all right, excellent. So um, we've got some results in. Um, so I think if I close this now, you can also see kind of what people are doing. Um, so I'm going to share the results on the screen. Um, so this represents around about 70% of of the folks online at the moment. So um, you can see quite a lot of people are interested in and in, in actively doing all of those types of analysis. Um, and then, yeah, the, obviously the dynamic and on the thermal analysis, which is great, it's high up there. So, <laughs> Brian, I'm going to I'm going to hand the, the ball back to you. You know what to focus on now. So, OK. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So just moving to the analysis workflow. Um, so for these three different analyses, um, in different domains, uh, we're going to analyze all of these in one environment, so within Sim Center 3D. From uh, starting from a single assembly part, we can use different arrangements to configure the different components, and then we use the arrangements for building the meshes. There's one mesh for thermal analysis and one for structural. Uh, since the requirements for meshing are generally different between the two. And note that the static structural analysis uses temperatures from the thermal analysis. And also note the same structural mesh is used for both uh, the vibrations analysis and the static structural. So we, yeah, we're, we're starting from the same assembly part uh, for all of our analysis and we're reusing um, that same part and reusing meshes as well. Okay, so I'm now going to jump to the first demo. But first, I want to show the basic inputs and outputs of the analysis. Uh, if you just go to the presentation, um, Jay. Uh, JF, could you go back to the presentation? Thanks. 
Uh, yeah, just the next slide there. So we'll use the uh, stowed assembly and mesh for the dynamic structural analysis. Uh, random vibrations are usually described in terms of power spectral density or PSD function. The PSD function defines the distribution of power over the frequency range of excitations. And we will use the PSD curve from the general environmental verification standard published by NASA for this analysis. For results, we'll be inspecting margin of safety, peak stress, and PSDs at specified nodes. So next, next slide. Okay. So we generated uh, an eigen solution with NASTRAN 103 to generate stress and displacement results. So the first solution we set up. This is a required step when we were running random-based excitation analysis because we first need to calculate the mode shapes. The required outputs in your random-based excitation or RBE analysis need to be aligned with your NASTRAN 103 solutions. And for this case, we have uh, 100 modes requested. I've linked all my ground interfaces with rigid elements to a single point for excitation to mimic a shaker table test. Uh, and I've also fixed the point so I can excite it in RBE analysis using my PSD input. Uh, for the NASTRAN 103 results, you can post-process different modes if required. Uh, you can see the results here. So I'm going to bring up a mode and we can look at displacement just to show you that it's possible to post-process the different modes. Now back to the response dynamics RBE analysis. Uh, engineers often hand calculate RMS results to obtain the three sigma responses, which are typically required in the space industry. Since RBE computes peak results corresponding to desired confidence level, this manual step is not required. Uh, so in the solution here, we can see our confidence level set point for the analysis. And I'll also go into our output request to point out a few useful uh, results we can request. So first is peak results, which represent the three sigma response. We can also request uh, PSDs at specific nodes. So here I have a group where I've uh, included some nodes on the bottom of the rover. We can also request safety margin, where we can connect with the uh, yield stress of the material uh, with a safety factor, and we can contour safety factors. So I'm going to go now and inspect some of the results. So first, we can look at peak stress. So notice the uh, higher stress around the wheels. And then I have a um, result snapshot of margin of safety as well. So we can see uh, in red the lowest margins of safety. So this would indicate where we might need to modify our design. And finally, we can inspect the PSD curves for our selected nodes. Notice we get acceleration and angular acceleration in all directions. We can also overlay these curves in a plot. Uh, from the plot, we can also export the curves if we want. For large models, uh, RBE analysis is an order of magnitude faster than other solvers. So by a factor of 200 to 11,000, um, depending on the solver being compared to. And we actually have a white paper on this benchmark study and we'll uh, have a QR code for you at the end if you wanna access it. I should also mention sign-based excitation is also available in this environment. So yeah, that, that wraps up the random-based excitation uh, analysis in Center 3D.
So we'll now move to the second demo, where I'll show you how we can set up a parameterized rover model with solar panels and a heater. Firstly, I'll talk a bit about the mission. So the analysis will take into consideration operations over the first lunar day, including the deployment of wheels and moving off of the landing platform. We will include a thermostat controlled heat load, which will be used to ensure component survival at cold temperature extremes. We will also use expressions to operate onboard electronics based on the total amount of energy absorbed by the panel. We can also consider various landing sites by tweaking our solar heating boundary conditions. So the inputs for this analysis include the stowed assembly with the panels deployed, articulations to deploy the wheels and move the rover off of the platform, and also the lunar surface modeled at various latitudes. Uh, in, in the outputs, we're gonna look at temperature results of components, absorbed solar flux of components, energy collected by the panels over the lunar day, and uh, power consumption of the controlled heater. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay, so in the thermal model, I've added a mesh for the ramp as well as the lunar surface. And I'll first hide the exterior body so we can see the internal components. I've applied an expression to monitor energy absorbed by the panels and apply heat to an internal component once a minimum threshold of power is absorbed. So I set this threshold in the model to 40 megajoules. Uh, using, using this approach, we ensure an adequate amount of power is stored in the battery to survive lunar night. Uh, the heat load expression is applied to the component with the red mesh shown here. I've also applied a thermostat controlled heat load. Uh, the set point for this thermostat will operate the heater once the temperature of the sensor drops to minus 20 C and it'll, it'll deactivate the heater when we uh, reach minus 15 C. We also have several articulations to move the wheels and the entire rover off the ramp during the analysis. U factors will be calculated appropriately to ensure accurate solar radiation applied to the rover assembly. Here's the solar heating object, which defines solar heating on the lunar surface at a latitude of zero. Uh, there are also several other solar heating scenarios set up for the various latitudes. If we want, we can also create additional solutions in the same analysis to evaluate thermal behavior at the various latitudes. And uh, I'll just switch back to the presentation now to inspect a few results from the analysis. So here we have the energy collected by the panels shown on the screen. You can see versus time, the energy collected is going up. Uh, once we cross the threshold of 40 megajoules of energy collected, the onboard electronics are turned on and heat is dissipated from the component. So it's important to note here that, you know, we have an expression in the analysis and we are switching this payload on based on live collected energy it's not um you know a time-based table okay um next next slide please this is the results of the thermostat um the thermostat controlled heat load so with a thermostat controlled heat load you automatically get a csv report containing sensor temperature and power consumption automatically generated um we can see here the sensor temperature is the red curve so when we reach minus 20 C, the heater cycles on, and you can see the, the sensor temperature bouncing between minus 20 and minus 15 near the end there. Um, notice also the orange curve, which shows the total energy consumed by the heater.
And next we have an animated contour of absorbed solar flux, where we can see the articulation of the rover with the wheels being deployed and the rover moving off the landing platform. Notice the absorbed solar flux contours show appropriate shadowing as the rover is uh, moving. Okay, so it comes to the second round of polling questions. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so as I launch this, also a quick reminder, feel free to ask questions. Um, we will have some time after this to uh, go into those questions. Um, so uh, for this next poll, we're going to um, launch it now. So hopefully you'll see it on your screen. Um, so just a kind of question about the challenges you have performing the analysis you currently do. Um, so yeah, we're just interested. Um, you know, is it the solve time, the time it takes to run them? Um, the, you know, the features you're looking after, the physics you're trying to model. Um, do you have some challenges around the, the data management aspects of this? Um, uh, you know, matching up, having the right inputs, managing those aspects, the ease of use of software, um, or getting at the results you want, the post-processing capability. Um, so I'll give folks a few seconds few more seconds to answer. I see some answers coming in, so thank you. Um, as you can see, some of the stuff Ryan's presented, um, there's certainly a lot of capability here. Um, and I think, Ryan, you're, you've made some comments on solve times as well. Um, again, if you have any questions, whilst these final set of answers coming in, please feel free to ask them. All right, I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. Um, so some interesting uh, feedback is actually quite spread. Um, so challenges with solve time, I would say, it's, uh, um, and uh, physics and features requirements. Um, so we'd definitely be interested in, in finding out a bit more of that and ask some questions. If you've got particular features in mind, if you'd like to find out more, feel free to put those in the questions. Uh, data management challenges, a little less. Ease of use is coming out really high, okay. It's an interesting one. So, and then post processing. So, Ryan, I'm going to hand the ball back to you if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. So, on to the third demo here. Uh, looking at the static structural analysis, where we're going to use the uh, temperatures that we just calculated in our thermal model. So, the input for the analysis. Uh, pretty simple here, so we'll include the thermal results and uh, a gravitational load. In the outputs, we can inspect stress and displacement to verify the model is behaving correctly and to evaluate the durability of the various components. Um, next slide. Okay. Okay. So here's the model. You can see it's deployed. Uh, first thing I want to show is the arrangement. So I'm just going to open the assembly and I'll show you a few arrangements. So here I have the arrays deployed and I also have a stowed position. Now for this static structural analysis, I'm going to select fully deployed because that's what I want to use. Uh, and I'll go back to the simulation. But one thing to mention about arrangements is that when I change the arrangement, my mesh and my boundary conditions will automatically get updated and uh, I don't need to go rebuild my model. I can simply just run the analysis and uh, everything is taken care of. So, you know, you'll have your view, view factors calculated based on your updated uh, arrangement. Um, yeah, everything's handled. So I'm going to go into my uh, mapping solution, which we're going to use to map temperatures onto uh, the structural mesh. Um, so I can he see here I have a result input and I also have several output times. You don't have to read in every output time from your thermal analysis. You can just choose the times you want to run, and the solver will interpolate these times from the available results. 
when you run the analysis, you'll get a NAPTRAN solution automatically generated. And in the NAPTRAN solution, you'll get subcases for each requested time. And if you open each subcase, you can see here you have the, the temperature loads. I also have under loads the acceleration, uh, which is just applying the linear gravity we want to model. One thing I also want to show are the available results. You can request in the analysis. So we can see uh, some structural results like acceleration, force, pressure. Um, we can also get contact results. So looking at contact pressure specifically or contact gap. <clears throat> So yeah, that's just a bit about the results you can request. And then I'll jump over to looking at the, um, the mapping results because we want to confirm that our temperatures were mapped correctly. Uh, so I've imported my original thermal analysis on the left and I have the mapped result on the right. So notice the meshes are different between the two. Uh, so we have the coarser mesh on the left for the thermal model. And then I can also go into my static structural analysis and I'll just bring up uh, displacement on the left and stress on the right. Yeah, so that, um, that concludes this demo. And I guess on to the third round, Adam. Okay, yeah, we can do that. So, I guess this is a uh, sort of launching the poll. Um, I guess this is especially for folks who've seen stuff they might be interested in today in terms of some of the capabilities um, the guys have just spoken about. Um, so, yeah, if, if it, feel free to, to vote on this one. Um, so kind of ways you'll learn a bit more about what you've seen um and obviously we would be very up for chatting to you giving you a bit more insight into the tools diving into detail and i have thank you for those who are asking questions there's lots of questions come in um, but keep asking them if we don't get them to them in this session we will come back to you so all right a few more seconds to vote uh, and then i'm going to uh, close the poll Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to close there and uh, briefly share so you can see sort of what folks' feedback are. So, yeah. Um, so, lots of people obviously interested. This represents about 50% of the people on the session. So, I'm going to hide this and pass. Back to you. I think Ryan, you've got a few concluding comments. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so just to mention, uh, launch and landing survival, thermal analysis with articulations, and static structural analysis can all be handled in one environment, uh, SimCenter 3D. The response dynamic, random-based excitation, and sign-based excitation solver is an order of magnitude faster than competing solvers. So 200 to 11,000 times faster, uh, depending on the solver. Changes to geometries and assemblies are associated to meshes and boundary conditions. This means uh, if you change the size of a component in the assembly, you can automatically update the model without having to rebuild it or remesh. Uh, and for future work, we are currently working on developing a calibrated lunar surface model based on measured topology and thermal data, which is kind of cool. Um, so next by JF. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to show a little snapshot here. So this is the imported geometry. You can see we have a mesh on here already. And, uh, you know, next step to calibrate to some measured thermal data. So. So that concludes the presentation. Um, 
Please find on the slide our contact information as well as links to some white papers, which include the random based excitation benchmarking study. I think that's the one on the left as well as the paper on how to perform random analysis on mixed laminated composite metallic structures. 